Hi everyone, I am Chirat Thakkar, Commissioning Editor at Roli Books, and you're watching Roli Pulse, a new digital initiative. This is a specially curated series, Publishing Perspectives, where we bring together our peers from the publishing ecosystem to facilitate exchange and cross-pollination of ideas. Remember, you can check out all our previous sessions on our YouTube channel, Roli Books, our IGTV on Instagram, as well as on Facebook and Twitter. And if you want us to put out more such content, then show us your love. Type in your comments in the comment section below and share this with your colleagues, peers, your friends, and anyone you wish to. This is the seventh episode of Publishing Perspectives. And today's conversation is on the secret success of children's book publishing. And I'm very pleased to welcome our speakers for today. Belinda Rasmussen, Venkatesh M, Sarah Odidina, Vatsala Kaul Banerjee, and Shayoni Bhattu. <laughs> Uh, Belinda Rasmussen heads Macmillan's Children's Books Division, which is part of the Pan Macmillan UK uh, publishing house, which also has an India division and home to the Gruffalo amongst many other best-selling children's brands, authors and illustrators. Uh, we have Vatsala Kaul Banerjee, who's publisher at Hashit India, where she looks after children's and reference book division. She was previously with Puffin and has worked in the children and young adult space for Target, Child and the India Today group. We have Sarah, who's currently editor at large for Pushkin Children's Books in London. She's worked in publishing for over two decades and most of that time in the world of children's books. She was publisher earlier for Bloomsbury's Children's Books division for about 14 years and has been the founder for the List Hotkey Books for Bonnier Publishing. We have Venkatesh M, who's been an accountant and journalist at different points of his life and has set up an exclusive children's bookstore, Eureka in 2003, along with his colleague Swati Roy. Five years later, they came up with Bukuru, India's first li children's literature festival that began in Delhi and has branched out to 15 more cities with 36 editions. Our moderator for the evening is Shayoni Basu. She is the co-founder of Duckbill Books and currently consultant editor with Penguin Random House India for the Duckbill imprint. The children who were born in the year that Shayoni started working in children's publishing are now getting ready to be parents. So welcome all of you to this very special discussion for Roli Pulse. I'll just have Shayani get us started with the chat. Please enjoy this conversation. Thank you, Chirag. Good evening and welcome to Roli Pulse, a digital initiative from Roli Books. I love the title of this session, The Secret of Success of Children's Book Publishing, because um, certainly for Vatsala and me, I think we've been searching for that secret for a very, very long time. And I don't know, well, I don't think I found it. So the first thing I'd like to ask all of you, uh, ask the three publishers here at least, what for you is a successful children's book? And what is a successful list? Um, how do you judge it by reviews, awards, sales? Uh, what would constitute a good sales track record in your market? Belinda, would you like to go first? Yes. I think it's all of those really that you mentioned. It's sales, it's awards, it's the uh, it's the reach of the book. We I think as children's publishers, we really want to reach as as many children as possible and find find the right book for every child, ideally. Um, I always have to mention the the Gruffalo because the Gruffalo is our most successful. Um, one of our most successful properties and certainly one of the most successful properties in the UK. And there, of course, you have a book that um, has had phenomenal reach, has been voted as the nation's favorite book. It's got a, a, a Oscar nominated animation attached to it. It's sold into 84 different languages. We just cl closed four uh, language deals in India. So oh. really, yeah, just recently. So really enormous. But at the same time, we, we publish um, a Pakistani British, a British author called Muhammad Khan, who wrote a young adult book about um, radicalization, actually, the risks of, of radicalization. Um, it was a book that perhaps has not yet reached the heights of the Buffalo in terms of sales, but that, that was really, really important to, to our reputation and what we want to try and do with our books because we got a, a lot of fantastic reviews, but also a lot of feedback from readers who felt that in this book, they really saw themselves represented for the first time. And that's important to us too. So success is not one thing. <laughs> it can look very different. 
But Sala, what? What yeah, does a successful so children's as, book to you? <laughs> as Shani said, you know, in we in India, we have such different numbers and such different such a different history of publishing um, in English uh, in India that uh, sometimes you know when uh, like Belinda is talking, it's like one of those dream things, and. Uh, I think a publisher's dream, what we follow is to do good books that sell well too, right? And by a good book, I'd mean um, something that's original, creative, and that engages children. And for me, that's really important, especially, you know, when you come to awards sometimes, um, here it, it, it's seen as quite predictable what will be chosen as an award-winning book. And it's not necessarily always a popular, engaging book. So um, for me, the common set is my dream, where it's a good book, I feel is a good book, which children feel is a good book, and which reaches a lot of children with which sells. That common set is pretty hard to find, but um, what we tactically started to do with is that we chose uh, nonfiction as the mainstay of our list so that it could free up revenue for us to do the books we love and which may not bring us the, that kind of revenue. And for me, the, a successful list is more important than just each being, book being successful. And for each book to be successful, there are different objectives. For, so like for Gruffalo, you had a different one. And for another book, you'd have a different objective. And as long as they fulfill their goal to give me enough room to do the books that, all the books that I want, to me, that is what, is successful and for the past three years um we've been managed we've managed to make both our list and our division profitable and so i'm really ha in a good place where i can choose to do Yay. especially fiction because fiction doesn't sell uh so well in india local fiction so if i have the freedom to do that that's for me success sarah what's success i absolutely um echo Belinda and Fad Salah and agree that the, a, a successful list is a list that pays the bills going forward to allow us to publish more books. I think a successful list also reflects the editorial tastes and ambitions of the people who work on that list. Um, the, the most successful lists tend to have a lot of editorial passion behind them with people who pref really believe in the authors and the author's stories. Um, I don't know that, I mean, it would be wonderful to have a crystal ball and to be able to say, this book is going to be a bestseller, this book mm -hmm. is going to be a prize winner, this book is going to um, completely engage children. Um, we, we, it's, it's such a, there's such a lot of luck involved in making a successful mm -hmm. list. Mm -hmm. and, and it comes, it really is fed by the passion of the people who buy the books, promote the books, sell the books, do the PR. It, it's about the team working together to, to lift all of these books up and to, to put them out into those places. I mean, certainly, you know, Belinda's involved with the Gruffalo. I was involved with Harry Potter. And I, I don't believe that either of us in acquiring those books would have had the idea that they would have gone on to be the phenomenal success that they have. But both of those books have opened the way for people to think about how children's books can sit in the market and sit in the world. Mm. Both as very solid works of literature and, and really solid storytelling, but also really commercially successful. And very importantly, um, a successful children's list has backlist. It has mm. a, a life that goes on and on and on. And that people will be reading those books 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 years from now, that the, the the mark of a successful list, I think, is a list that is supported by this lovely, healthy backlist and the sales that go with it. Um, and I think, yes, we want prizes and yes, we want sales and yes, we want to engage with an audience. And really, that it's a kind of a, a lovely cocktail of all of those parts that make a list successful. That's, that's what we need as publishers to survive. So, Venki, when you're booking um, authors for your festivals, how far is the success of a book a criteria in your selection of authors? Or is it more a sense of give um, new authors a space? See, there are two ways uh, I look at it. One is when you talk about the success of a book, we used to run a bookstore so mm -hmm. a long time ago. 
and uh, for and us and soon again soon hopefully yes and uh, for us uh, the success would be if a mother or a father comes in with a child and picks out a book and suddenly they sit down there and read the entire if it is it a picture book it is a small book sit there with the child read the entire book they enjoy it and they buy it and take it away that's a sort of success which we have seen in the book store mm-hmm. but when we decide a festival we do not we the whole idea of bookero is the it should be a new book which has been published and we have a lot of discussion with publishers for their uh, views on which author we should take so it's not you won't know what the sale of a book is a new book is mm-hmm. uh, but we have had instances where publishers have said that let's launch this book during bookero maybe or let's have a Uh, limited edition print out print out just for bookeru bookeru usually happens in delhi and happens on last weekend of november so it's it's a, it's a consultation with the publisher saying that you know you you tell us what our list is and then the new books we go the publisher also tell us that you could try this or we may ha- we might have a few authors which we think we should uh, invite with the publisher's help so we don't look at success in terms of sales while doing bookeru it's more of introducing new books during a particular festival during and how important do you think the festivals are in propelling an author towards success uh in terms of uh, getting children to know about them certainly yes in terms of sales they have been good uh, good sessions good uh, sales and uh, not so good ones but does sales also sometimes depends on the session the author is doing uh, but it does not necessarily mean that the book it could be bad just because the session didn't mm-hmm. go off well mm-hmm. so for us the biggest thing is after a session when 50 children rush to into the bookstore asking for that author's uh, <laughs> book it works yeah does it vary according to city since you're now doing it in 15 different yes, cities yeah 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 it does uh, okay uh, what we have done earlier before 2017 we used to have every children's book under the sun displayed in the bookstore but after 2017 we just managed to focus on the participating authors books just so that their books you know get promoted and get read and get bought purchased by the children so that, that way yeah there's not much of a change across cities because they are going for the authors the, who are coming there earlier there used to be a little, change, a little thing in the sense that we used to probably sell more uh, international titles than indian titles that has changed drastically for us now so it's it's more they're, they're more popular now they can they, they watch a session run and buy the book get it signed uh, which wasn't happening before 2017 now that we are all sitting at home uh, planning our books and festivals for the future how do you feel um, covid and the worldwide lockdown is affecting the publishing decisions that you're taking over the last weeks as you sit at home and read manuscripts um is it shaping your decisions in any way is it um, do you think this is a time that you want to look at steady well established authors rather than launch new unknown voices into the world um sarah why don't you start um Well incredibly it's it's as we were talking earlier on it's been about 2 months that we've been in lockdown working from home and already I'm beginning to see quite a few submissions coming through dealing with pandemic type scenarios either fantasy or non-fiction or picture books to help children deal with this subject and there have already been some really wonderful books published mm-hmm. on the on the subject yeah. um I don't think that my response to this crisis will be to start to publish books around the theme um i i think what i would be what i'm probably more inclined to be looking for is our books that are uplifting and books that um are heartwarming love filled stories that will make people feel good and secure and safe and um and 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 not threatened um of course in children's books and particularly in YA issues like pandemics and and terrible plagues is something that appears often in in mm-hmm. young people's literature because of all of the things that can be explored in terms of themes through that so it's not a new subject to our market but um 
it's not one that I would immediately rush now to start looking at books on the theme. Mm -hmm. We will continue to look for new voices at Pushkin because that's what we do. And we'll continue to look at voices that embrace the world because that's what we do. That's, that's our philosophy. That's, that's the thing that motivates us as publishers every day. Um, and, and I hope that we'll continue to be brave and, and courageous in terms of what, we, what our selections. We, I don't think we would be, if the lockdown was to continue for a year, for example, I think we would probably think hard about launching a debut writer in this climate because it would be hard to get the profile needed to have that writer noticed. It, it's much easier to publish an established author in this climate. Um, so I suspect that would be something that would, make, would influence us. And we have moved a debut author who we should have been publishing in June and we've sort of shuffled her along into July in the hope that by July bookshops would be open. But back to the theme of um, festivals and, and um, literary festivals, how important literary festivals are to us because they give us the opportunity to get our authors in front of audiences. And it's a really important way of building a readership for an author. And of course, all the literary festivals this year have been complete, all of them have been cancelled and there's so many in the UK. So we, without that support for our authors, we're kind of books out into, I mean, I can't even describe what we're putting books out into. We're putting it out and we're putting them out into a nothingness. So I think a healthy publisher has to think about how we reach our audience at the moment and Without those, without bookshops being open, without literary festivals, without the ability to do visits around school book fairs, um, through visiting schools and doing events in schools, we're, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're slightly um, in, inhibited in all, all of the things that we can do. Uh, Belinda. I concur with the, with the, what Sarah has said. I agree with Sarah. I don't think, uh, I don't think, uh, kids particularly want to read about the virus and the pandemic, but I do think that a lot of positive things have come out of this. We have a whole, I don't know how it is in India, but in, in, U, in the UK, we have a whole reinterpretation of what a hero is, because a hero has become a nurse who goes in and works every day in a very dangerous environment, or even the guy who delivers pizzas in the evenings. I think that's interesting. And, um, I think that the the nature and the fact that we can hear our birds in, in the gardens, which is something we can't normally hear because of the airplanes, and then sort of real interest for nature is another. I see that a, a bit as a, a trend or something that's that's coming out of this. And then I think children coping with anxiety. I think that was a theme already before the, the COVID-19, but maybe even more important to address now. We've, we've even got like a, a preschool series for very little kids called Little Big Feelings about I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling happy. But I think, you know, dealing with, with emotions is, is key. And I actually, I found some statistics uh, from something called Kids uh, Insights, which are uh, a group running consumer uh, research. And they said, interestingly, that uh, over the last few months, that fantasy as the favorite book type to read within fiction has increased by 22.9%. Um, so, and the market that was most up there was Spain, uh, where, no, 20, uh, Germany, where it was up 26.2%. But, you know, in all markets, 23% in the UK, fantasy had suddenly taken a lift. And in the US, comedy books, had become had increased so I thought that was that was quite interesting and for young adults for teens it's really self-help and coping with anxiety and those themes but it's I think we need to focus on the positives. Yeah. Atsila how is this shaping your publishing plans? Um, you know if you look at uh, the list of the uh, top 10 20 books over the past you can take five years. It looks like it's never a good time to introduce new books on new authors. <laughs> the same authors and the same brands have been sitting across there. publishers. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, short of <laughs> some sort of violent coup, uh, there doesn't seem to be, uh, but yeah. So I, I've been, so funnily enough, Hachette has had the three, 
Hachette Adult has had the three books about pandemics so or related to pandemics, you know, the Dean Coons, there was an asterisk with coronavirus mention it and the Sylvia Brown. <laughs> and um, they're doing well. But uh, coming to kids, um, I, I fun enough, haven't got any submissions which have to do with COVID, which is, which is fine with me. I sometimes get adult submissions uh, into my ID because they don't take unagented ones. And I've seen loads of adult submissions for COVID romances, COVID this, COVID that. But luckily, I haven't got anything. And, you know, I think in India, um, this is unprecedented. But we have had, we, we are surrounded by all kinds of disaster things uh, all the time. And our kids have to have had to deal with uh, realities, not just themes in books, but realities of communal conflict and terrorism and natural disasters. And I think um, the, the worst disaster, even worse than this, is this long, unending poverty. And even those themes haven't been fully explored or brought into books for children that we sell to, because we sell um, to mostly to urban kids and to do a, a cool book about poverty or even about the pandemic. Um, let's see what the authors bring to us because I think there's nothing worse than fiction that's built around a very hard, indigestible ball of agenda. Mm. You know, so those agenda books, they're just like, Mm. undoable. So I hope something organic mm -hmm. goes and would love to do something like that, but I'm not, you cannot program. Yeah, fiction. it has to happen. Yeah. yeah, The way one can program nonfiction, it yeah. will reflect definitely in our nonfiction books as news or as reflective articles, but then we do those anyway on climate change or refugees as we've done in the last couple of years. So Let's see what comes. And actually, in response to what you said, uh, I was recently re reading a review of one of the uh, new books that Duckbill had published. And the review said that this book says that it talks about people um, in small cities and, you know, different lifestyles. But thank God they don't show too much poverty. And I just uh -huh. found it really interesting that that was this yeah. review take yeah, on the book. That's quite telling, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, so Venki, you, your world is going to be more directly affected and more drastically over the next few months. How yes. do you think? Yes. yes, it's already been affected What's, for us yeah. in the sense yeah. that uh, we had a festival uh, in uh, March, uh, on March 15th, which got, had to be cancelled. Hmm. And there was one on uh, March 22nd or 23rd, didn't happen. So we are facing a little uh, problem just now but uh, we hope the next one in fact we have also cancelled most of our station out of town like the others four other cities which we had in our plan uh, but we are going ahead with the Delhi edition for sure that's in November and we hope uh, it happens in the sense see the biggest problem any festival I think faces is uh, the funds mm -hmm. so, and uh, we have been struggling all along for funds, but this year, this one, because of the COVID thing, it seems even worse for us. Uh, but we are not planning to scale it down or, uh, you know, we are hoping to get support from, which we have got all these years from publishers. And uh, we'll have to tweak a little thing here and we may not be able to get many international authors. We may not be able to like, you know, fly in people from mm -hmm. uh, outside Delhi. But we are keeping an open mind. It's uh, still five months to go. And uh, yeah, we are badly affected. And uh, Bukharu is never even ticket ticketed. So that's another big reason uh, funds uh, are the crunch for, for us just now. And more importantly, this year, this year would be the fact that how do we get the children together? Will they, will, can we let them like, you know, meet each other? Can, we, can they be close to each other? Questions we don't have answers to just now. That that that's that's weighing heavily on our minds just now at mm -hmm. the moment. But we we uh, Indians as Indians we seem to be immune to so many uh, diseases. So maybe we hope that the herd immunity takes over and we are okay by November. We we just about started a few online sessions because there's no way we can go to schools with the authors, for instance. So what we do is we have authors who do Zoom session with the uh, schools. 
we fix the classes and talk to the schools in advance we fix a day and a one hour session every we have done in may we have done 10 at 10 i think just now and uh, also we have done small we have a concept called bukuru lit house so where we have authors uh, illustrators storytellers they come in and do an hourly session with people so the, uh, like tomorrow we have one with ajit narayan which is a cartooning uh, workshop so all these are the, we have made them paid you know so that we can also pay the speaker for the main festival going online is a possibility but it's very tough since uh, it involves technology and we make sure that everything works perfectly the audio video uh, but we have plans for a semi online thing before the delhi festival so we we are trying to think of the best way to do it i think that's i mean that's the way to go now it's uh, mostly online and then a little uh, on ground stuff for instance when we we our bookstore for instance we closed down in 2014 but uh, and we had we thought plan to open it uh, this year we start we thought we'd go and give it another chance and everything was ready but this uh, corona virus happened and we stopped all the work there so our tentative opening was in april 15 which never happened so now we everything is limping back to normal but we are just going in with the with the hope that if books if the people don't come we'll do it online but the bookstore has to be there for somebody to walk in and see what the bookstore it's we had a lot of you know what do you call withdrawal symptoms when we closed down the bookstore for 6 years mm. which is why we are coming back with the bookstore but it's hope so we are running on hope just now we need hope very badly yeah. uh, so yeah. um and of course one of the things for all of us in children's publishing here is eureka reopening is you know has been a beacon of hope from the start of this year now even with the delay we are that's something we know we have to look forward to there is light there is light there is light yes, yeah um bookshops are reopening uh, but at least in the short term uh, when people are trying to be careful and perhaps even in the longer term uh do you think uh, there will be a greater shift to ebooks uh, sara belinda in the indian market ebooks for children just do not sell we pretty much publish them just because you can but they're not a big part of what's it i don't think they're a big part of your sales are they no yeah okay uh, in the first month of uh, the lockdown we saw like a 86 percent rise in ebooks but it dropped down to about 10 to 15 percent in increase over pre lockdown days but you know in in children's books discoverability is such an important thing browsing by parents is such an important thing um and i i i hope that it will you know grow the market to a point at least where we what we see abroad but um, um i don't I don't know if that's really going to happen. No, I mean again uh, from this from this consumer research that's been done there has been a surge in ebook reading during the crisis. So numbers are up uh, between between 10% and 20, even 22% in France. Mm -hmm. But what we don't know is does that have to do with uh well certainly the crisis and more children are reading more as well so that's good that's that's mm -hmm. been demonstrated as well but it may also just be that ebooks are easier to access right and easier to get to and that might mm -hmm. be affected by the crisis i i think there's always um for me there's always two forces going on there there might be a surge in ebooks now because they're easier to get mm -hmm. get hold of but i still think it's always against that thing that most parents just want to get their kids off screens Mm. true right you yeah. don't really and 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 particularly like during this period where you know they they on screen to to do their school work and mm. then you let them go on screen to play their games because you have to work <laughs> there's a lot of screen time and i think the what the mm. sense is a respite from that from that screen time mm. and of course and like, there's all sorts of motorical skills and whatever but it is interesting to see that that uh, ebook reading is up during this period statistically speaking at least yeah i think kids also don't want to spend their screen time reading books i mean you know no it's something no. you can yeah i think children remain very loyal to the 
to the book format, the printed format, um, we've seen a big lift in some of our titles in ebook. Um, but they're in known authors, authors who were already selling really well, and um, classics. Um, new authors, it's, it's really very, very hard to get to have people, as um, Vatsala was saying, to have people realise that the books are even there. Um, I think one of the interesting things that's been happening here is to look at the way that certain retailers are thinking about how to get books to children and to adults um, because um, bookshops have been closed. So waterstones.com, they've seen a really extraordinary lift in sales and their website has, I think, improved vastly in the last couple of months in terms of how they actually promote books. And then local booksellers, I, I live in an area mm -hmm. where not terribly far from where I live, there's two or three really good bookshops and I can email them or talk to them on Instagram or through Twitter and say, I want a copy of this book and they order it and they, they deliver. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes mm -hmm. around on his bike and stuffs it through the best box. Um, and I found that really reassuring that retailers are actually thinking about how they remain engaged with their audiences. Mm -hmm. And of course, authors themselves are working so hard on social media to have people remember that they're there yeah. and they're yeah. doing so much. They're reading, they're posting parts of their work, they're doing um, events for children through schools. They're really working tirelessly during this time. So while we have seen a lift in some authors' free books, we've also seen an innovative approach to how we can continue to sell print books to people. I mean, we've seen a phenomenal wealth of create. I'm really glad you mentioned that, Sarah, because we've seen a phenomenal wealth of creative material online from our authors mm -hmm. and illustrators. Yeah. They have been so inspiring. And so they, they like from the day of the lockdown, they just started posting. And to the extent that we're actually signing people up from things they've done. Oh, <laughs> what fun. Online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're That's the amazing. Levels the levels of creativity are mm -hmm. astounding. And I think it's really been such a, it, it certainly, I don't know, Sarah, whether you felt the same, but it's lifted my heart that this, what, this happened when we had all those terrible things going on at, at the same time. We've had lots of Indian children's authors who are doing sessions online to the extent that sometimes, you know, there are like three sessions going on by authors I really like at the same time. So you're kind of spoiled for choice. And then you're like, okay, yeah. I also have to do my work at some point. Yeah. <laughs> then on, the, on the positive side, like from Kerala, uh, we've got news that, you know, the bookstores have as much as 75% of their uh, buyers back, but there are other areas where it isn't um, that good. And uh, right now the supply chain is completely uh, in a shambles. Mm -hmm. So that is a problem that even if you do want a book and the bookstore will deliver it to you, home deliver it to you, the book may not be in the store and it's so difficult to procure it from there. I mean, if we don't have a second surge or when the first surge subsides, I think that the six months later, we could be looking at a much better, I hope that we'll be looking at a much better scenario in terms of you know people going to bookstores and uh, if, you know, all goes well, we could be looking at uh, resuming our, you know, at least 80-90% of our sales again, and let's hope for that. It's, it's, very, so, uh, sorry. Okay. it's very interesting because we still don't have a bookstore, but there's a vague idea people have in the neighborhood that, you know, it was supposed to have been launched. We get phone calls, mm -hmm. almost one every day saying, do you have this book and get it delivered to our place? Very difficult when we don't have the books just now to uh, get it to the yeah. place. I just wanted to add that, and we've, we've worked a lot with our um, independent bookstores because, of course, everything is closed in the UK. But the independent bookstores, again, have taken such initiative in staying uh, close to their communities and having mm -hmm. author sessions and anything they could do online. And we've been trying to support them. And in particular, our sales rep, who usually sell to the independents, obviously in some ways, suddenly didn't have a job doing that. But then instead, they sort of reinvented the relationship and then really supported them. They do that normally as well. But now they're really kind of mm -hmm. uh, being part of that. It's, that's great to see. I think the indie stores are going to be so important mm. in the coming months, you know, to be able to do that hand, hand selling and that kind of delivering that 
you know the other bookstores the chain stores haven't even opened the ones in yeah. the malls uh so yeah i think it's good that it's already begun i think in terms of, in the uk as we ha- our shops haven't actually opened yet we're still only supermarkets and pharmacies but people are preparing for the idea of opening and um yesterday i was reading something about waterstones which is our main chain now in the uk thinking about how they can open to the public again and one of the thing one of the ideas one of the concerns is what will they do with all the books that people have gone in and handled and put where are they going to what are they going to do with them are they going to disinfect them are they going to take them out of stock for a while and then put them back in a few days later there's huge logistical problems so for the small independents who actually don't have to open their doors particularly but to, who can communicate with local people in terms of what they can get for readers locally they this could be um a point of advantage for them because i i can't imagine myself as a confirmed book buyer heading off to a large shop in piccadilly to wander around with lots of other people at the moment potentially lots of other people at the moment touching books and looking at things I mean, even when we go into supermarkets we're told not to touch things just take down off the shelf the thing you want don't browse and and that kind of defeats the purpose of of a physical <laughs> bookshop in a way yeah. i think in every crisis you see an opportunity arise um and i think what we have we perhaps we have a little bit estim- underestimated what digital and online could do yeah. we we had a um online poetry session for our children. we 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 also do we're number one children's poetry publisher but it was something like poetry to feed your soul or something during the crisis we had over 100,000 people engaging with oh, that oh wow i mean wow. we were like what <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is this and and i thought it's great isn't it because i think you know there's always an opportunity right they always you learn something new and the return of poetry is a great beacon <laughs> of hope the return of poetry has been you know surging amazing and you may not have done that initiative if it yeah. weren't this and you exactly. wouldn't have known that there were that many people ready to um engage engage, engage yeah. yeah i think the thing for me is that stories books stories are things that unite us as people and covid has slightly driven us apart slightly i mean it has physically mentally driven us apart physically but stories are ways of us staying in touch with one another and building bridges with one another and um i think there's been a lot of book clubs there's been a lot of people who have are reading the same book with their friends and meeting on saturday night on zoom and having a glass of wine and talking about that book and using the story as a way of reconnecting and something that i do personally is i have two grandsons in in los angeles and about two or three times a week we have a lovely hours and hours on facetime together to give their mother a break and i we do all sorts of things and one of the core things is reading and i was just oh, making nice. note of all the books that we've read <laughs> in the last two months and we've read about six or seven novels and we've read very funny contemporary things we've read poetry we've read philip pierce and they they just get so much out of it but i know they get a lot less out of it than i do which is sharing this wonderful thing that we care so much about and even through a screen can connect us and stories do that and they will always do that and there'll always be a place in the world for stories because they that's their fundamental role in a way they they connect us all yeah that's wonderful uh, sara what you said and i think shani will agree with me that the last couple of months have been um interesting because india is a very knowledge and general knowledge based market and the last few months the online sessions that um storytellers uh, authors have held have um hopefully uh, revealed to uh, you know the parents who usually push their children into more uh, knowledge oriented things i mean traditionally knowledge oriented non fiction or reference that stories can uh, be so valuable at a time like this and at any time in in life uh, you know not just to 
entertain, but to help their children uh, feel connected to so many things that are, have happened in the world or in the imagination, you know. So I think it, it's been a good thing uh, if one wants to bring, um, to bring out something positive from what is happening uh, right now that we have reintroduced in a way uh, stories to, to our kids and to, you know, to the mediators, the parents and the teachers. That is true. But Vatsila, I think what has also happened in the last couple of months and Venki as well in India is that we have seen more division in terms of social class than we ever have. And yeah. as children's book people, we really have to try to work to bridge that, which again, because we work primarily in an English language publishing environment, um, I think those bridges are going to be very challenging for us to build. And I mean, right now, it's almost beyond imagination what we can do. Hopefully, with time, we'll be able to figure mm. something. Yeah, those bridges are, you know, just from, just from our access to, to something like this, you know, those, those divisions are born of this, the, of access, of lack of access yeah. to even a, a platform or to books or to school yeah. at the moment, you know. So, mm. yeah, those are big well, things that we need to communicate. One thing that's happened in the UK that's also given us as publisher publishers a slightly different role is that we've been working really closely with the BBC and the education for the Department for Education um, because of home, various homeschooling sites where they have needed material and mm -hmm. things. And we, we really engaged with that and felt such a, you know, it's so great to be part of that greater course. And that, that, that was a new new development, but also a way to get books up there, actually, in a slightly different way. I think the best uh, thing which has happened during COVID, the good news is that it's got a lot of people together, the booksellers, the publishers, the, the authors, the illustrators, everybody, the content creators, uh, closer together, I think. You just look at Facebook, just look at what's happening there, what people are doing together. It's never, mm -hmm. I haven't seen this before. So we normally have like, if somebody asks us for permission to use something, we have a whole process and a system on it. But during this period, we just say like, yes, great, take it. You know? But hey, I mean, it's much better, isn't it? It is. Oh, our things yeah. are fine. And we saw them and I had friends texting me that they had used the book with their child. You know, so I, I, I have felt more coming to uh, physically coming apart, but Mm. psychologically coming together in a way uh, spiritually coming together <laughs> actually I read one story on social media which is like Sarah and her grandchild uh, grandchildren which is this mother and her 14 year old son uh, had to be uh, were in lockdown in different places and because the lockdown was announced at short notice they couldn't get back together so the mother called uh, the son every evening and read to him for an hour Yes. Uh, a, a book by Siddharth Sharma, uh, Sarah, okay, yes. and, and it was uh, it was amazing because they both wrote about it and the child wrote a review about it. But the whole idea of books books being the only thing which connected the mother and son and yeah. their thoughts on it was incredibly moving. I think in that situation as well, it's so important because. If, if you talk, you know, when I talk to my sister on the phone, it's like, what have you been doing? Nothing. What have you been doing? Nothing. Yeah. So with stories, sharing stories, you have something that takes you out of this yeah. situation. Yeah. So actually, our neighbor um, has three children and I hear her in the garden every day reading to them. And the oldest is about 12 and the youngest is about eight. And, you, and I just think it's, I just, love it so much to hear her voice and, and the children <laughs> completely silently listening to her. It's a beautiful okay. thing. And it, that, I think through all the it terribleness is. that's going on, as Belinda says, we are finding ways to support each other, love each other and share with one another. And stories are a part of that. Thank you all very, very much. Belinda, Sarah, Vatsala, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank, thank you. you. And thank you all for joining the discussion. Please follow Roly Books on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for updates on more exciting activities from Roly Pulse. Stay well and believe in books. <laughs> thank, thank you. you too. Thanks, Shani. Thank you, everyone.